Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Mark Taylor, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am the CTO at Chorus. Uh, I believe we've got a mix uh, attending, attending this afternoon. Some of you I have met, and some of you I haven't. So um, thank you for taking this time. So this afternoon's webinar, um, we're going to be starting with a quick intro to Chorus, but won't take long on that, don't worry. And then we're going to be ha talking for 10 or 15 minutes on um, some of the foundational stuff of modern IT security. And that's delivered through something called Zero Trust, which we're going to talk about for a little bit. And then we're going to be jumping in with my colleague, Mark Jones, and uh, Mark's going to be discussing what modern CSOC should look like. And we're going to have a good mix of demos. And we're going to be looking at some of the things we can do with Azure Sentinel, et cetera. And Mark's going to take you through some of those pieces. And then finally, I um, should say that there'll be some time at the end for Q&A. Uh, so if any of you have got questions during the session, please post them in the Q&A chat box. And um, also we will be recording the session and the slides and video will be made available later today, hopefully. So with that in mind, let's get started. Um, <clears throat> like I said, start with a quick thing about Chorus. So who are Chorus, those of you who don't know us? Um, we're a uh, Microsoft Gold Partner, um, based just on the outskirts of Bristol and Head, um, And we're an MSSP, um, as they like to be called these days, so Managed Services Security Partner. And we work across a significant proportion of the Microsoft stack, is how I'll refer to it. So that's everything from, um, obviously today, a little bit so we're going to focus on the cybersecurity and security stack Microsoft offer, but we also do uh, modern workplace, things like autopilot, uh, Windows Virtual Desktop, Microsoft 365 and Dynamic CRM. Along with all the supporting pieces that go with that around network and comms, business apps and uh, tele telephony. So Microsoft security stack, let's start with that, shall we? It seems the most relevant piece for today. Um, some of you may or may not be aware that uh, Microsoft security stack is pretty extensive these days. Um, I'm sure some of you may well be aware that Gartner, um, who are a, a well-respected uh, measurer of these things, uh, refer to Microsoft these days actually as a security company. And I like to talk a little bit about the fact that, and although this is obviously and clearly not a Microsoft pitch, uh, why, why is it that Microsoft are so heavily into security these days and why is it such an important part of their offering? Um, and as much as it is about offerings they can make to customers and they are very much about do, offering good security for customers, we have to be realistic about the fact that Microsoft via their cloud services today um, are pretty much, and depending on your personal measure, the provider of the largest um, hyperscale cloud in the world. Um, they have many, many data centers offering many, many cloud services. And those services hosted both for themselves and for customers are unsurprisingly under attack pretty much 24 seven. So it's in Microsoft's own interest to be a leader in the security space. Um, and I'm not going to go into the too much detail on the boring parts of that, but basically I believe that Microsoft are currently leaders in about, I think it's maybe as high as six of the security um, quadrants that, that Gartner offer. And as I say, they do refer to these days as Microsoft, that's a security company. So we put some numbers on that as well. Um, so Microsoft invests about somewhere in the region of about a billion dollars a year at the moment on R&D and security space. So it, again, it's a very, very serious space for them and certainly something customers um, should be looking to take advantage of. I think one of the things that people sometimes forget is that as a uh, as the largest B2B provider for um, businesses in the world, Microsoft have a lot of those businesses data and cybersecurity in 2021 is all about big data. And so I think, you know, it's very reasonable to ask questions about, you know, actually Microsoft are best placed to assess that data. They have somewhere in the region of a trillion authentications a day on the network today. Um, and they have access to an awful lot of information that puts them in a good place to provide good cybersecurity for their customers. So. Also, we've said obviously we're a bit of an MSP, we've covered that off um, and uh, we talked about some of those other systems, but we're not going to go into those today. So I'll move on and we can talk a little bit about the importance of cybersecurity. So some of you, again, prob probably think to a certain degree, and I would agree with you, that it's a bit self-explanatory these days. I think we all turn on the news every day and there's stories left, right and centre about the various um, attacks that are underway and who's been hit lately. So I, to a certain extent, I get it is it is self-explanatory. However, I think there's probably a few points worth calling out. Um, 
first amongst those for me, I think, is there's a little bit of um, everybody suffers from, I think, what they call professionally is optimism bias. So that belief that, you know, it won't happen to you. Um, now, again, it needs to be really clear, certainly not advocating the scare story approach here. That's not the intent whatsoever. But I think it's fair to say that um, as with all these things, the actual market that drives some of these cyber attacks is actually changing. It has changed over the last few years. If you all think back, perhaps, uh, let's say two or three years ago, we would have been reading in the newspapers about WannaCry and Nonpetya and some of these types of attacks. And those attacks were very impactful at the time. They got a lot of press coverage and they did a lot of damage. However, um, Although there were financial impacts on those and financial outcomes and financial exploitations, it's not quite on the same scale or with the same focus that it operates today. Today, these gangs have become a lot more focused. They are a lot more organized. And today, we on the ransomware front in particular, which is a, a particularly hot topic at the moment, it's what we refer to as human operated ransomware. So what we mean by that is that rather than it just um, infecting your network randomly, um, somebody clicking on a link and, and, you know, before you know what's happened, there's a little bit of um, encryption taking place, which still happens, let's be clear. Um, what we're seeing more and more of is actually gangs who are actively carrying out compromises, uh, getting into networks, spending a little bit of time uh, reconning those networks to figure out where the most valuable data and assets in that business are based. They then will actually go to all the trouble of looking at that company financially, figuring out what it's worth and what sum of money they think they can exploit, and then carrying out the ransomware attack. Um, now I say that because obviously we've got some examples on screen there, which I've no doubt you all saw. The Colonial Pipeline attack got, got quite, quite a bit of coverage for obvious reasons. Um, Although actually financially, interestingly, by no means um, the biggest one in that week. So I think they think that the colonial one was worth about four million dollars, four to five million dollars. But in actual fact, in the same week, there was an insurance firm in Chicago who paid out 40 million dollars in order to get back control of their systems. Um, and obviously, we've also had the uh, JBS one and, you know, uh, you know uh, the worst end of it, but obviously a particularly bad one in terms of the attack on the Irish health system. Um, again, because that obviously has material impact on people, definitely, uh, and not in a good way. So, again, these are very much, uh, as I say, it's becoming more sophisticated. I know it's easy to think it, it, it kind of won't be you, and, and I hope it isn't. Um, but as I say, there, it is driven purely by financial gain, and it's very focused. So very much, um, you know, many, many organizations are at risk these days. Also, we're saying that um, we, we deal with a lot of customers who obviously are very keen these days to get cyber insurance to help cover them in the event of these types of attacks. And what we're seeing more and more of is that those insurers are upping their game very significantly in terms of what they're asking organizations to do. Uh, in order to protect themselves. So we've worked with a number of fairly sizable organizations in the last uh, six months, everywhere from, from sort of 1,500 seats up to 25,000 who are talking to insurers who are saying to them, we're not kind of asking you nicely if you've got some of these things in place, we're saying you have to have them in place. Otherwise, not only are your premiums going to be very high, but we're going to set very substantial excess payments against these premiums so that you, um, you, you know, you're very much encouraged to try and get some of these things done. And that's before we get into the whole GDPR, reputational damage, cost impact, etc., and reporting requirements. So that's the, the background as to why this stuff is important. Um, actually getting some of the technical stuff now and talk a little bit about how we do it, how we're going to be doing it in future, hopefully, and, and how these things are changing. So the old model, as I'll call it. Um, and when I say old, you know, clearly a lot of organizations, they're still doing this. Um, so it's what we used to call the perimeter model. So Castle and Moat, as it says there on the screen, the idea that you kind of built a fence around your IT network, you put your firewalls in place, um, you put little bits of security software on the network and you just built a wall and tried to keep everybody out. Um, use VPN to let everybody in and it was all great and secure. Uh, that that just is not a a workable model in 2021 um, and that's partly about hybrid and cloud and how resources are in different places now whichever organization is using one form or another and it's just basically moved on it's it's a it's a it's a model that's not suitable for the way that it works in 2021 um 
it's it's vulnerable in a number of places. The VPN one's particularly amusing for me. Um, amazing how many organizations I still speak to where VPN is very prominent. But when you ask, you find that, for instance, that VPN isn't configured with two-factor authentication. So very easy for a third party um, uh, criminal to compromise a user's mailbox, get hold of their email address and password, and then use that same logon set of details to get access to a VPN. Now, once they're on their VP on your VPN, they now have access to your network laterally. And very easy for them, for them to use a, a very well-known set of techniques to elevate their privileges to administrator. And before you know it, somebody's gone from having basic access to your network to very free ranging access at admin level across your, your traditional IT network on prem. So yeah, that's the old model. So how are we going to do it better and how do we how do we do it in a in a more modern way? So the new model is called zero trust networking. Um, I'm saying new but it's actually been around for quite a long time. So it's not new new. Um, I think what's new about it really is that in the last few years the technology required to enable zero trust networking in it in its true fashion has only recently sort of become available and is mature enough. Um, and in actual fact some elements of it um, you know are so the, in particular the network side of the market which has got its own version of zero trust um, is, is still being worked on. However having said that so what is zero trust networking? So it's pretty pretty straightforward conceptually to be honest with you it speaks for itself you trust nothing um, and the idea is, is that you, you're really trying to look at four pieces of information every time somebody wants to do something within your IT infrastructure so you're asking who are they as in identity identity is critical and I talked about MFA earlier so who are they uh, what data do they want access to where are they and what device are they on so again, that sort of, you know, the who question, the device, could it be, you know, mobile, tablet, phone, etc. Uh, and the the where, you know, are they at home, are they in the office, are they in a coffee shop? So the where's thinking about there on that diagram about the infrastructure and the network pieces. And then finally, the data and the apps. What is it they're trying to access? Are they trying to access files? Are they trying to print? Are they trying to access our CRM system? Are they trying to access the finance or HR systems? So if we take those four questions, and we combine that with uh, the modern set of tools that can go along with that. So in particular, in the Microsoft security stack, I'm thinking about something called conditional access, which uh, you can think about as being the engine of um, a zero trust model. Um, and I'm going to move that slide on actually to kind of perhaps give a, a slightly better uh, visual representation of that. Um, and you can see in the middle there we've got something called security policy enforcement and in a Microsoft world that that's what we call conditional access. If we ask those four questions each time somebody tries to access a piece of information on our network, um, then we can use those rules to determine whether we want them to let them in. So if we know the person was accessing it, we know who the user is, they use the MFA, we know what device they're on, maybe they're on a company laptop and we know they're in a coffee shop and we can say, okay, actually, well, they're not in the office today, so I'm not going to let them access the most critical data on our network, but because they're on the network and on our device, I am going to let them access some of the less important pieces of information on our network. So that's the very basic concept behind Zero Trust. Um, there are obviously more elements to it than that. Um, one of the other big things we do with Zero Trust is we do something called Assume Breach. So we're always working uh, when we're designing systems on the network to think to ourselves, let's assume somebody has compromised some credentials and is already on the network. So with that kind of mindset, those kinds of pieces of information and that kind of approach, we can use that technology stack to start thinking about how we can secure the network in a more effective way. And then finally, we're going to move on to um, then what do you do with that information? OK, so now we've got our zero trust network. We've got our principles in place, um, although to be clear with, some, with this, a lot of the security stuff, obviously it's by no means the case you have to have all the pieces in place. You, you, every business will have its own priorities and you can look at all the pieces and decide for yourself what's a priority for you and which pieces you want to deploy first. Um, but we can take that Microsoft security stack use the various products within it and in particular obviously we're calling out things with here things like the Microsoft Defender stack so Defender for Endpoint, Defender for Identity, um, lots of Microsoft tools there available to help defend the various parts of those um, zero trust I just talked about and then on top of it we put Microsoft's Azure Sentinel product which is its um, 
what we call its seam product. So it's a big overarching product for managing the security of all these systems and, and, and looking out for um, nefarious activity, should we call it, and which is obviously the focus of what hopefully Mark is going to demo to us very shortly. Um, so yeah, with that in mind, um, that wraps it up for me. So I'll hand over to Mark now, who's going to walk you through a little demo of some of these things and how we can uh, secure your network for you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, great introduction into the topic of Zero Trust. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today for this demo. My name is Mark Jones and I work, of course, as the principal cybersecurity architect. Um, so I have technical oversight into pretty much all the work that the cybersecurity team do here. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly around um, some of the points that we think are really important when implementing a modern cybersecurity operations center um, and I, I'm going to transition between the slides and, and the demo environment we have for you and uh, hopefully show you a couple of interesting pieces um, that suit the points that we're talking about. So the first point I want to talk about is uh, enriching data through contextual information. Um, so obviously for any sim all the examples today are going to be in Azure Sentinel because that's what we use as a preference, of course. But for any SIM, really, this applies. And you want, when you get alerts through your SIM, you're going to have various entities. You're going to have uh, devices, usernames, file hashes and things. And we want to enrich that data, get more information about those entities so we can improve uh, the tools the analysts have to um, triage those alerts. So I'm just going to jump into my demo environment now. And hopefully everyone can see that fine. Um, and this is the demo environment. Just to give you a quick example, I've set all these up uh, and there's a couple of alerts for us to look at. But this is basically the front page of Sentinel. Um, and you can see that I have uh, I have an alert here for an unusual number of failed sign-in attempts on one endpoint. So I've created a VM and I've left RDP open to the entire internet and it took about nine minutes for this alert to fire to say someone was trying to uh, get onto that box. Um, and just a very quick example of a rich enriching data. You can see here that I have a few entities within this alert. Apologies if it's very small to see. But I have the, the, the name of the machine and the IP address, which is the source IP address for all the failed sign-ins. So very quickly, something that Sentinel gives us the capability to do is run playbooks. And these could be um, automated responses to alerts. Or in this example, I'm going to show you what it looks like just to um, get some more information. So this is a box I've left on the internet with RDP open. Someone's tried to attack it. And at the moment, I just have an IP address, but I can run this IP quality score playbook. And that's just a logic app that is going to contact the IP quality score API. And it's going to give me some more information around the IP address that's in this alert. So you can see that this has, this is from Russia. And um, we can also see that IP quality score has given it a fraud score of 78. So immediately, I have some very useful information around that IP address that helps me as an analyst decide how serious this alert is and, and help me investigate this alert. And, and really, that's very much what all these points that I'm going to make today are, are going to be referring to is making life very easy for the analysts. Um, so on to the second point now. And we're going to talk about threat intelligence. Um, and I think threat intelligence is, is probably something that's well understood by most security operation centers. I think um, most security operation centers will bring in threat intelligence, perhaps produce their own, and they'll be looking for matches um, with all the signing logs they have, or they'll be looking through logs to, to make matches with known threat intelligence. And um, we do that as well. There's nothing wrong with that approach. That's a very valid approach. Um, but we can also take it a step further these days. Um, we have capabilities to improve what we do with that threat intelligence. So rather than just look for matches and look for events that have happened, we can be a, a little bit more proactive with what we do with that threat intelligence. So I'm going to jump back over to my screen now. 
and uh, hopefully you can see Sentinel. I'm going to go over to threat intelligence and just show you that we're bringing threat intelligence into uh, into Sentinel. So you can see we have all kinds of custom threat intelligence that we've brought in. And for this example, I'm just going to talk about the IPv4 threat intelligence we have. So you can see one right at the top here is an IP address that's attached to some malicious behavior. So if I jump over to my logs and I just pull through any threat intelligence indicator that has uh, an IP address in it, then I have a list here of 12 IP addresses. And we can take this further than uh, just looking for matches, although we do look for matches. I can very quickly show you what that looks like. So here we're matching cyber threat intelligence to the sign in logs, which is perfectly valid, but let's take it a step further. And I'm going to talk about how we can update conditional access dynamically with our IPv4 threat indicators. So a very, very quick demonstration, but you can see here I have one conditional access policy and uh, Mark Taylor set me up very nicely for this because he was talking about conditional access being the engine uh, in Microsoft land uh, for accessing all your apps. Um, and here I've just set a condition which is, is based on my location. So I'm going to block any attempt to sign in that comes from one of my IPv4 threat indicators. And if I go to my name locations, you can see I have IPv4 threat indicators here. Um, and you can see that they've been populated. I'm just going to remove a few of these so I can show you. Um, Excuse me, I'm just going to remove a few of those so I can show you the automation working. So I just take a few of them out. So we only have one IP address in there. And I'll click back into there. So obviously we do this on a recurrence. So this is happening basically as we receive threat intelligence. But essentially we're just using a logic app and we're using the graph API that Microsoft provide, which gives us all kinds of automation capabilities. And I can run this logic app and uh, once that goes through, we should see that we're essentially dynamically updating that named location and uh, feeding in feeding in all our threat intelligence. So if I just jump back to my condition access screen and I'll just Go back into this name location. You can see through the graph API we've updated with those 12 IP addresses I showed you uh, right at the start. And then if we go back to the presentation, the next point is talking about being proactive versus reactive. So the the, the threat intelligence uh, example I just gave you, where we're using threat intelligence um, and we're making that immediately useful for ourselves. That's an example of being proactive, but really I think what we're talking about here is freeing up enough time for the analysts so they can focus on more proactive measures. So we want the analysts to be focusing on, on threat hunting. We want them to be focusing on building new use cases, on working on detecting things that we currently can't detect very well. Um, and, and we don't want it to be reactive. So proactive, we want our analysts working on, on threat hunting, which is essentially it's been demoed to death, so I won't go into it. But essentially our analysts are, are coming up with theories of how customers could be compromised. And then they're using all the historical logging information we have to try and prove those those theories and, and to find new indicators of compromise. Um, and then on to the fourth point, um, which you've probably got from my first couple of demos, we're very, very big on automation. So all of this is underpinned by automation, automation, automation. And I'm going to repeat myself again and say the whole purpose of automating is obviously to increase our security capabilities, but also on a very high level, we're using automation just to make life easier for the analysts to free up time so they don't have to do things. So they have more time to be um, proactive and work on the service improving things that we want them to work on. So as a quick example of useful automation, I'm going to jump back across into my demo environment. So talk through the automation demo again. Essentially, I have a, 
a server here and apologies if I'm repeating myself but you can see uh, if I pop back to Sentinel that I have an incident that I've spawned that relates to uh, this endpoint and um, I was talking about how an action an analyst might want to take is to isolate that machine uh, and through Defender for Endpoint we can we can isolate machines cut the networking on them and we can do that either fully or partially so we can be selective about it and say that Teams and Outlook should still work or we can cut it entirely so in this example say I was investigating an alert and I've decided there's evidence of this endpoint being breached or I'm not sure it looks likely and I want to spend more time on it but there's a risk I might choose to isolate the machine um, and to show you a, a, a complicated series of steps that are made easy through automation um, we have this playbook here called isolate defender for endpoint device I can run that if we needed approval on isolating a device then we can build that into the approval flow so say this goes off to an approver or a manager or perhaps a customer who wants to approve before we take action they can hit approve on that and then if I bring up this virtual machine here you should see that now I've approved that action that this machine is going to get cut off and we'll lose connection to it and I I already can't click on anything in this machine so I will assume that's already happened but we should get the uh, disconnected message shortly and then so we've isolated this machine and then the last point I was trying to make around that demo is um, you know it's all well and good isolating a machine but I just want to make the point that we can still continue our investigation even though we've cut off the networking for that machine I can still connect to a live session um, and I can still as an analyst continue my investigation into anything suspicious on this endpoint cool. um, and then the last point I wanted to talk around was security expertise which kind of sums up all of these points that to have a successful security operations center and to be able to implement uh, this level of automation and um, you know have the analysts who are capable of doing this work you really need security expertise and it's very difficult to find I think um, a statistic that's often talked about is that there are more positions for security experts than there are trained people and obviously security moves at lightning pace and to keep the uh, security staff up to date with the latest developments is um, is very critical um, and that's the last point I wanted to make and now we'll move on to any questions so if anyone has any questions to ask then feel free to pop them in and uh, I'll do my best to answer them Thanks, Mark. Sorry, um, apologies for the technical issue there. I'm just getting a few questions coming in. Um, please do pop your questions into the Q&A though. Uh, but the first one that I've got is, um, we are still mainly on-premise. Is the automation shown only useful for cloud environments? Um, that's, that's a good question. I would say that, um, it's not only applicable to cloud environments. I'd say the 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 ease of automation and and the opportunities we have in in a cloud environment are probably better. But certainly from an Azure perspective, you can make use of something called a hybrid worker, which is kind of an agent you can install somewhere on premise. And then basically the same way I've been showing you with the Logic Apps is I could have a run book that's tied to that hybrid worker on premise. Um, and I could I could trigger that agent to run from a logic app essentially so I can bridge between the two and, and run things on premise and it's something to give you an example of that um, obviously a lot of companies that we work with have Active Directory on premise and they, they're syncing their identities up to the cloud um, and so we can't just disable a user in Azure AD because it wouldn't disable them in Active Directory so we use exactly the same approach I've just talked about to have a hybrid worker on premise that can disable the accounts thanks Mark. I've got a few more questions coming in um, 
perhaps the easiest one first is, would you consume our E5 logs if you provided a managed service, or would you expect access to our admin portal to provide the service? Uh, that's a, another very good question. I we wouldn't need access to your admin portals. The way that we onboard customers is through um, Lighthouse. So we give ourselves basically delegated access so we can see everything in, inside your tenancy from our tenancy. Um, all the logs for E5 products can be brought into Sentinel and free of cost as well. So you're not paying to ingest those logs into Sentinel. Um, and then we have access to all that information through Sentinel. There, there may be some things that we need to do inside of your environment, but we typically do those through service principles. So as part of the onboarding process, um, you know, in the example I gave was isolating a machine through Defender for Endpoint. We would create a service principle in your environment that has the necessary API permissions to do that. And then we would be able to use that from our own tenancy, but we don't need access. We don't need credentials in, into your environment to, to provide a, a security operations center. Brilliant. Uh, we've actually got quite a few more questions coming in. Um, so next up, I've got, are there different levels of a managed CSOC? Um, there are different levels. I'd say we offer, we offer a hybrid CSOC, so where you might have staff who can manage nine to five, but you need coverage overnight, then we can offer that. Um, but typically the service is, is 24 seven and there aren't really t tiers to it. Um, everyone benefits from the automation we work on, you know, and it's useful for the customer and it's, it's also useful for us doing our job as well. Um, and another one I've got here is how does this work across the whole customer estate from AWS Azure, custom apps, Salesforce, etc. Um, well, what 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 data we bring into Sentinel um, is 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 up to the customer, and we'll work with the customer on what is important to them to bring in. Um, we can build detections, rules, and and parsers around pretty much any, anything you have. And if there was some piece of automation that would be very useful to a company, um, for example. You know, an action that's taking a long time for a security team to, to perform, and um, then obviously we'd we'd look to automate that. And uh, so far, we ha I don't think we've run into anything that we've not been able to automate. So um, yeah, we let, let the customer direct us on, on what's important to them. Brilliant. You you might have touched upon this earlier, but I've got a question. Um, what does a typical onboarding process look like? Sure, yeah, um, I can probably do a quick demo. So I can only talk about this from a technical standpoint because that's my remit. Um, and I think I mentioned before that we onboard through Lighthouse, which means that there's obviously various benefits to onboarding through Lighthouse. We can see all of our customers' environments through our own tenancy. So we don't have to have credentials in all our customers' environments. We don't have to move between them. If I have one job that I need to do across all customers, for example, say Microsoft announced a new vulnerability that affects Exchange probably based on how this year has gone so far. And I wanted to deploy that to all my customers, then that would take, would take no time at all basically. And, and the same thing with threat intelligence. We can bring threat intelligence into our own tenancy and all our customers can benefit from that um, threat intelligence. Um, and if I show you very quickly what that looks like for a customer, that might be a better way of showing. So if I just bring up my screen again, um, and Lisa, I'm feeling quite paranoid now, so if you can just tell me that it's Thanks. working. All good, we can see your <laughs> screen. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Um, and basically, if I wanted to, if I if this was a customer and I wanted to onboard to Courses CSOC, the main technical steps for them are to find us in the Azure marketplace and um, follow the instructions um, to delegate access into their environment. So if I run through that very quickly here, if I go to security and just search for Chorus, you should see we have a couple of offerings already on the marketplace. 
Um, and if I wanted to sign up to 24-7 Manage CSOC, I'll choose that one. And let's go next. And here are the permissions that we're asking for in our customers' environments. So we obviously have our tier one analysts who can run automation and, and respond to alerts. And then the senior analysts who can do a little bit more. We also have a service principal um, that has permissions essentially only to, only to Sentinel that we use for reporting. And then we'll let that deploy. That should be very quick. And then if I go to that resource, the, the final step then is to delegate resources. And we'd only look to be delegated access to the resource group that contains Sentinel. So I would do it like that and agree to the terms. And that's all I need to do for Chorus to now be able to see into this customer's environment. Um, and we have tried to streamline the process in, in many ways. So for example, we have centralized customer information we have our own API that contains customer details. And essentially, once we add your details to that central API, then all of our logic apps are going to pick up that customer information and um, you'll benefit from the other pieces of automation we've built. Lisa, are there any more questions? Um, we've got actually quite a lot coming in. Um, I, what I might say is if we do one more question, um, all the slides um, and the recording will be sent to everyone this afternoon. Um, if we haven't managed to get round to your question, please feel free to um, reply to the email. Um, we're getting a number of questions that are slightly more detailed, which we'd be happy responding to. Um, but I will go with the final question of, um, sorry, I'm just, to find. Do we have to have Sentinel as well as um, as well for the managed CSOC? Um, well, we we would look to use. Can you just repeat the question for me, Lisa? Uh, do we have to have Sentinel um, as well as you for the managed CSOC? Is the question that I've got in chat. I, I think that's asking um, is Sentinel uh, necessary for the CSOC service? Um, for our CSOC service, I would say Sentinel is necessary. That's what we're experts in. That's what we use for our automation. Um, so, I mean, for us, we, we would look to use Sentinel and the SOAR capabilities of Sentinel. Um, but, you know, we work with customers who have something like Splunk and they import their Splunk logs into um, into Sentinel. So. Um, you can often use Sentinel in conjunction with, with other sims. Perfect. I think um, if it's OK with you, Mark, we'll wrap it up there and I, all the slides and recordings will be sent this afternoon. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for your time. And uh, sorry about the interruption to the demo. <laughs>